C on CW contains adult language and discussions. If you're easily offended, do not continue to listen. You are listening to DC on CW Supergirl Edition on Rain Man Digital. If you're listening from your desktop, you can take us mobile by downloading the Rain Man Digital app available in the iTunes App Store and Google Play. Just search Rain Man Digital. And you can also find us on demand through iTunes and Stitcher by searching DC on CW. Once you find us there, please go ahead and leave us a review. Say some nice things or some bad if you really hate us. But, you know, please don't. Uh, Today... You've got me, Lauren Alexander, your host. I have Nicole Nance with me. Hello. And Bobby D. Hello, hello. We're going to be breaking down and discussing Supergirl Season 3, Episode 3, Far From the Tree, a.k.a. The Dadisode. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) That's about right. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Kara accompanies John to Mars to help McGon. John and Maggie uh, attempt to reunite with their respective fathers. It's literally The Dadisode. It was a, uh, it was weird to have a, I guess non Supergirl centric episode. Yeah, but it's it's always refreshing when we get those. Yeah, no, they did it w- well. Yeah, Supergirl is one of those shows where, um, I feel almost as attached to the rest of the cast as I do to to her. It's not always just about her. There's there's so much going on. It feels like you know a real circle of friends, which is cool. All right, so let's talk some news. We've got an article here from Bleeding Cool. Supergirl Season 3, why it's important for Kara to have a secret identity. Uh, so this, this writer opens up with like, hey, we talked about how they brought back the secret identity aspect with Kara Danvers. Uh, I'm not a fan of that and appreciate have appreciated how most of the Arrowverse do away with it and avoid the sitcom moments, but there may be a specific reason for the writers to bring it back for the third season. Um, McGrath, who plays Lena Luther, Katie McGrath, she told TVLine.com that Lena not knowing about Kara is exactly what she needs. Uh, I, I think it's important for Kara to have someone she doesn't have to be Supergirl with. If Lena knew the truth, she'd always be Supergirl, and she needs to be Kara. That's what this whole season is about, her struggling with her humanity. She has to be solely that person for somebody, and if that person has to be me, it makes me feel special. Oh. <laughs> that was, like, in sync. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, that's, that's a pretty good point, though. You know, it's, we, we've kind of been throwing out our idea of when we think Lena will be in on the secret, but... Um, That is a pretty good point, because clearly just in the past couple episodes, Kara has been struggling with that dichotomy of Kara versus Supergirl. Uh, And when is it appropriate to be witch? And, you know. Yeah. And I just think they talked about the other character, the other shows not having that. Well, most of the other shows don't have a tie with a fan like the two families have a tie with each other, you know, with Superman and Lex. That could throw off the relationship a bit. And I think that that's why they continue it because it always creates that drama that we always talk about. It's like, what's going to happen when she figures it out? Because she has to figure it out. Yeah. And, you know, Oliver doesn't have that with anybody. Or, you know, Barry well, doesn't have that really with anybody that, you know, if they find out, it's going to ruin everything. To be fair, though, too, I mean, I I think we can all agree that Arrow had that going on for at least three seasons, though. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. um, Supergirl's still, like, the the freshman show. Mm-hmm. 
even though Legends and Supergirl are on the same season, Supergirl was late to the CW party. Yeah. And Legends, it still really doesn't even consider itself a superhero show. Right. It's a show with superheroes. And it's a time it. travel show with yeah. comic book characters. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I think, I, I mean, Nicole, what, I, what do you think? I feel like it's a really good point, And she does kind of need that that person that doesn't expect Supergirl things out of her. Yeah, I think um well, I I think she's really the last one that doesn't know out of like at least the main supporting cast. Um so it you know, if she finds out now, then it's always gonna be Supergirl, Supergirl Supergirl, Supergirl, and then we get rid of the car storyline altogether. Like I could see that's that's what's gonna happen until we introduce new characters into far as life if they find a way to do it so i i kind of like i kind of like having that one at least one that is still that juggling act it's like leaving a little bit of her innocence yeah (laughs) exactly yeah (laughs) all right yeah i can see that uh we've got another article here from bustle.com when mon l returns to supergirl season three star chris wood says he'll change the show in a major way i don't know if i like this (laughs) I <laughs> shit, we're going to find out. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mon L will be back this season at some point. There's a quote here from Chris Wood to Bustle. Uh, he said he's carrying the baggage of where he's been and what he's been through. He uh, <laughs> apparently the details of his return and what he's up to are shrouded in mystery, he said. And he can't mm-hmm. discuss them. <laughs> However, he does reveal that when Monel returns, it's going to mix things up quite a bit. At the end of season two, Monel was forced to leave Earth, blah, blah, blah. He's in a pod. He's gone. We don't know if he's dead or alive, but he's obviously alive because we know he was cast for this season. <laughs> he showed yep. up with them in San Diego. Right. Yeah. Um, we don't know so, if he's in the future or in the past. All we've seen so far is him appearing in dreams and motivational visions uh he's not fully back on the show but he Mm. says he says you know uh his return affects everyone this guy who was one thing is now another thing and what he carries with him (laughs) it provides a different perspective to what the other characters are doing and it sort of changes the dynamic of the group in another way it definitely creates a domino effect how vague can you get yeah. He's one thing and then he's another thing. Like, okay. What do you mean? Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Looking good. All right. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, I think even with the vagueness, you can kind of see that he's coming back with Saturn Girl and kind of, you know, maybe from the future, maybe with the flight ring. You know, there's some things going on there. And I think that's how, you know, the shakeup will be. He's bringing other people with him. Yeah. Or they're bringing him back or what, you know, whatever they're doing, you know, totally. uh, it's it it's there. It's just one of those things of, you know, I want to see how, you know, again, they talk about it's going to shake everything up. Like when she's just getting over it is almost about the perfect time to bring him back. And she having thinking to some kind of dream or something else going on, but he's actually standing in front of her. And, you know, it, it just looks like this is going to be the mid-season finale. I could just see it. She thinks she's dreaming. Yeah. She wakes up. And he's still there. Yeah, I could definitely see that. There's so many options for the mid-season finale. But, I mean, this article also mentions Kevin Smith, um, who had directed the... Which is in two episodes, I think. Yeah. He directed episode... He's directing or directed. I don't know where they are with that right now. Um, episode five, but he also directed the Monel centric episode in season two. So Bustle g- is hinting at maybe that's when he comes back. But I feel like it's going to be later. I, yeah, I think it's too soon right now. Yeah. Oh, it's I, way too soon right now. She's got to suffer through it a little longer. Yeah. That sounds harsh, but. <laughs> yeah, well, no. <laughs> yeah, hard. We want you to <laughs> suffer. You're right, because we, we still haven't really established how rain is going to come about. And you would figure, like, those two things probably will happen at the same time. Because then, of course, his return is helpful if he really comes back with, like, Flight Ring and other people that can help battle, you know, this new supervillain that comes up. But they still got to build to it. They can't just rush right into it. Yeah, definitely. I think five is way too soon. Yeah, I think five is too soon. I think uh, think you're 
totally correct there. I think everything you guys said totes. on point. Totes correct. Totes correct. <laughs> uh, random cool thing at my at one of my jobs the other day, I actually found a uh, we listed it on on Amazon uh, a Saturn girl action figure that came with a Legionnaire flight ring. And I was like, oh, that's old and cool. It's like her classic outfit. That's pretty cool. Yeah, just a random cool thing that's relevant to this show and nothing else in my life. Yeah, you looked looked at it and you're like, see, they are going to have the flight rings when they come back. Yeah, see? This this toy from 1984 says so. It Yeah, see? See, guys? Predicting everything. Toys Mm -hmm. told us so. All right, with that, we are going to hop into a quick break. And when we get back, we'll tackle this episode. I love it. Are you... Crying? No. DC on CW. We'll be right back. The Rain Man Show. The Rain Man Show. Yeah, I'm starting to wonder that we may, we may (laughs) truly have some power. Why can't we target this and use it for good? I know. Why can't we push a show back and Kim K dies? Dude, it's the Rain Man show and you like her ass too much. You know what? Maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's I don't it maybe I don't believe in it. Did anybody maybe, know? You know how like they say you have to believe in the power of yeah. prayer? Maybe in my mind There you go. I I dislike Kim. But my little mind <laughs> is like, no, keep her alive. You may have a chance someday. And that's for some reason Your my mind. Slightly yeah. British. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> for more Rain Man, visit RainManShow.com. Hey, ass butt. I like how it's like violent confrontation. It sounds like daytime television. It does sound it does. like this. Yeah, it does. A little bit. It's like Castiel, the bold and the beautiful. It's like. Maybe that's the spinoff. Uh, oh. Daytime television, here uh, we come. God, no. It's going to give don't Ellen, Ellen a that. run for her money. Do not say that. That'd be funny. I'd, I'd watch it. All overexposed video look. And uh, like soft lighting and, and that's dramatic sheer, shots. That's sheer talent there. Oh, yeah. Sheer talent. <laughs> Didn't, hey, wait a second. Didn't uh, Jared get his start on daytime television? Yeah, that I think he did. His, his start. Yeah. yeah. And they quickly left that behind. Yeah. When, 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 they, when they realized he was too good for them. They're like, why is like, this guy shit, here? This guy's way too good yeah, why is this fucking show? guy here? Yeah, I want him off the show. He hey, can actually act. Hey, he's can making we get him look out of here, please? This guy's tall, and he's good looking, and he's a really good actor. Get him the fuck out of here. This is horse shit. As one of the other actors. Yeah. Hurry up, because I have a porn to shoot after this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've got to do anal after this. Can you hurry up? <laughs> Don't worry, we got to change the set over. You'll have time. Yeah, I need my fluffer in here. What the hell? I'm here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't miss Supernatural the Crossroads every week. On Rain Man Digital, go to SupernaturalTheCrossroads.com for more information. Hey guys, did you know that Rain Man Digital now offers a premium service? That's right, besides our weekly free broadcasts, Rain Man Digital now offers a premium service, and when you pledge to our Patreon page, you automatically become a subscriber. So it's easy. The premium service includes video content, plus additional exclusive shows like Star Trek from the Holodeck, Comic Book Chaos, DC on CW bonus shows, mm. Supernatural The Crossroads, and more. So head on over to patreon.com slash Digital and sign up today. I know I kind of promised Long Halloween, which we will get to, but they want to run a preview show for what will be our new Batman show called Wayne Talk. So that's what we'll be doing. Which no one's invited me to do anything on. I'm just going to throw you under the bus real quick. Well, we're just getting started here, so don't worry. You'll hear all your favorite DC on CW hosts uh, on Wayne Talk coming soon, but that's our show for this month. Have you ever wanted something so bad that you do just about anything for it? Well, that's exactly how we feel about you. That's right. AdamandEve.com wants you so bad. We're giving you 10 free gifts with your first order. You heard me right. That's 10 free gifts to spice up your love life. First, you'll get a sexy surprise for her. Second, an adventurous toy for him. And third, a little something we know you'll both enjoy. Plus, you'll get six full-length adult movies on DVD. 
And number 10, free shipping on your entire order. That's 10 free gifts for you shy types who've never tried Adam and Eve before. Just go to adamandeve.com and select any one item. It could be an adventurous new toy, a sexy piece of lingerie, or anything you desire. Just enter offer code DEAL30 at checkout and you'll get all 10 free gifts, including free shipping. That's offer code DEAL30. That's D-E-A-L-30 at adamandeve.com. Well, I'm not plotting to kill Barry Allen. I'm listening to Rain Man Digital's DC on CW. are back let's jump into this episode supergirl season three episode three the dad episode i mean far from the tree uh directed by dermot downs <laughs> and written by jessica queller and Der- Derek. Derek Simon. Derek. <laughs> Derek. Derek Cameron. uh words are hard and names sometimes all right so this is yet another really uh I don't know, kind of a bummer episode. Not bummer like it's bad, but they just, they are not shying away from emotions this season so it's, far. It's a feels. Feels heavy. It's a feels trip. We we signed our permission get, slips get and a took partner. a feels trip. Yeah. Hold yeah. hands. We're the, going on a the feels f- trip. Buddy yeah, system to the on feels the feels roller coaster and Jesus. Ugh. <laughs> Good Lord. All right. So let's talk about Maggie and Alex. Um... We've been kind of speculating. There's been a lot of attention on their relationship because they've got this wedding coming up. They got engaged last season, uh, you know, at the end of the season. And we've been seeing not huge waves rocking the boat yet, but some little ones that are bound to add up. Um, and it's been one or two of them in particular have come up a couple times so far. So, um, we finally get a little bit more detail on what happened with Maggie and her family when she came out. You know, she told Alex it was really hard for her and that she didn't have people supporting her like like Alex does. And um, she left it pretty vague when she initially talked about it. Mm-hmm. But this time, uh, Mama Danvers... Con- not confronts her. She doesn't confront her. She gently asks her, you know, hey, I see that you don't have any family pictures. So what's what happened? How long has it been? Blah, blah, blah. And Maggie comes out with it and says, you know, it, she was 14 when she told a girl at school she liked her and her parents found out. And holy crap, like her her dad packed her a bag of like a suitcase of stuff put her in the car and said that she had shamed him and just dropped her off with another relative. I, I, that, that whole thing just kind of hurt. I could never see, I don't know what my daughter could do to make me just be like, bye. Yeah. You know, that's, that's complete overreaction. Um, and so I gotta say though, um, Maggie Floriana Lima, her acting in that scene felt so real. Um, every time, every time she sort of paused, and it it just felt like she was really telling this story and trying to choke back a couple tears and regain a little bit of composure. Even just the way she said "um" at certain points, it it felt like I was watching a friend tell a heartbreaking story. Yeah, that nervous "um" instead of like just picture perfect you know reading or yeah. saying of the dialogue it is one of those things you always wonder what she's going through in her head to kind of hit that note or you know not note but you know oh, yeah, what i mean she's that tapping into something she, yes there's something it, back there that she's feeling because you can definitely see it and you know hear it in her voice it may not be the same type of thing you know she may not be gay or she may not have gone through a, a traumatic family thing as a young teenager but there's there's something that she was tapping into or she's thinking about someone else who went through something like that or, or something. Um, because, yeah, it was I, I mean, we've talked about it like Nicole. We've talked about it before where every single one of these mostly women, not that the men can't do the same thing, but a lot of the super heartfelt 
things are are from our female characters in this show. And um, they just, they crush it. Every time. They're real good at crying. Oh, yeah. They're real good at crying and choking back tears, man. It's, it's not soap opera-y crying. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's very natural. Well, and sometimes they make ugly faces. And, and they do. <laughs> when they're crying real hard. And that's normal. And they're, yeah, they're not afraid to be real on this show with the story and with the acting. Yeah. And that's what I like. That's why I love this show. Yeah, man. And, you know, I mean, Maggie said her, her mom removed all pictures of her from her childhood, just erased her. Dude, I was actually of... getting super angry at like the parents because yeah. like it's so uh, it's so irrational to me. Like I am all for the gay community. I I love them. I have friends and family that are like that, and it's totally one hundred percent natural in my opinion. But like I I don't see the other side of the coin. So obviously, I got just super angry. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's funny because I, I just resonate so much more with Eliza, uh, Alex's mom. I just, I, I feel the same way that she feels where she, you know, she tells Maggie, listen, the only thing shameful about that story is how your father treated you, how your family treated you. Oh, totally. You're not the shameful one. Um, you I, know- I, I couldn't imagine growing up with that guilt as a kid. Like I did something that made my parents just like completely disown me. I and- at my core am so wrong that my parents don't want me anymore. Yeah. And it's it's not a health thing or a money thing or, you know, like this wasn't a choice because this would be the better life for me. This was a they all of a sudden hate me so much that In- they pack me away. In her socially formative years. I mean, like, you know, you want to say that the the socially formative years are probably much younger. But at the same time, this kid's 14. What she's learning and feeling about interactions with other human beings at that point are so integral to who she's going to be once the hormones level out and she becomes an adult. You well, know? yeah, no, no, no doubt. Uh you know, relating back to like what I went through, I was a military brat. I was in a different school every three years growing up. When I hit like that age of like going to high school, when my dad realized it probably wasn't the best for me to, to move to another school or another state to have to make all new friends again, this is why I ended up in Arizona because he was just like, look, I can't do this to you again. You're, you're not running around a playground trying to meet new, you know, uh, friends. Here. You can't just make them again and you're just going to be a new kid out of high school. So, you know, I'm, we're staying here for that reason. You know, I'm staying for you because it's the time for you to kind of, you know, get those friends and again, not have to adjust to a new living or, you know, new setting. like Yeah, that. be able to actually bond with people and, and learn how to keep and maintain relationships. Um, Yeah, that was I mean, high school was when I finally got to stay in one place. It was my. Halfway through my sophomore year, I transferred schools and that's where I stayed until I graduated high school. Mm -hmm. And um, two of my best friends I'm still friends with from that time. I'm in touch with people that I went to school with. I mean, in touch is probably generous. I'm friends on I'm friends on Facebook (laughs) with people that I went to school with before that. But um, the only people the only friendships that have stuck with me are, you know, one person that I never went to school with at all, um, and we became friends outside of that, and then two people from that high school that I ended up transferring to, and you know, those are my only lasting, actual, legitimate. I still consider you one of my closest best friends, um, and it, it is important because there's people that have friends from like childhood, and that's really cool. Definitely don't have that, you know. I don't um, either. I don't. And I just, I don't, I don't understand. I can't understand a parent disowning their child for their sexuality or something. My mom, when I was, when I was in high school, uh, my mom at one point was just like, you know, I thought you were gay for a while. And I was like, huh, that's weird. That's funny. And it was right after I had just dated a girl too. <laughs> and I was like, Huh. But she didn't know about it because I was just like, I don't really tell my mom stuff about who I date. Uh, she was like, yeah, I don't really care. I mean, I wouldn't have thought any different of you. I'd love you either way. I have gay friends. 
I love gay people. That's what, <laughs> like she was just drinking and uh, like her third glass of wine that night. And she was just like, yeah, I'd love you anyway. I don't really care. And I was like, yeah, okay. That's the correct way, actually. Just casually being like, yeah, that's fine. You're still you. Moving on. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. So I just, I can't imagine. And that's, that's the only conversation we've ever had about that. Um, and it was just, yeah, I don't give a shit. You're my daughter. I love you. You can't really, you couldn't really do much to, to make me hate you. All right, great. Thank you. So I just, this episode is so, so sad and frustrating to me, but it's important as well because there are still people that think like that and treat their children like that. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, it's just, it's, it's so rough. So, but Maggie still looks at her father through these rose colored glasses because it's, it's her father. You know, he may have done this horrible thing and, and put her through that guilt, but it's her father. And at the end of the day, kids just want their parents to love them. They just want them to respect them and, and be proud of them. Um, you know, she talks about him saying he was the best father until that day. Okay. But he still did that to you though. And, uh, and Alex wants Maggie to, to reach out to him, which is not a terrible suggestion. You know, Hey, this is the perfect excuse to reach out to your parents and say, can we be in each other's lives again? Are you willing to make an effort? I'm getting married. Uh, it might not be to the gender of person that you would want, <laughs> but you know, but maybe things still have changed. Doing, still doing a big life thing here. Yeah. Um, and, and Maggie just brushes that off. These scenes between, that Maggie stole the show this episode. Definitely. Oh, totally. She, her acting was so good, so real. Um, the way that she gets kind of short and frustrated with Alex and just says, look, I love you, but just drop it. That is exactly the way that someone who's frustrated with the person that they love, um, because they know it's coming from a kind place, but they're not, they don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the way you would shut that down. You'd be like, listen, I love you, but just please drop it. Just drop it. Yeah. And yeah. It, ah, she's so good. So good. Um, so natural. Yeah. But she ends up making the call. And uh, and that was, a, that was a rough thing to watch, too. You know, her just going, um, hey, you know, we haven't talked. I, I hope mom is good. And here's all of this info. And um, I just hope you can come. At first, I thought she was talking about a machine. Yeah, I thought she was leaving a voicemail. I thought she was leaving a voicemail, too. I, you know what? To be honest, I couldn't totally tell because... I think they kept it vague for a reason to keep you on your seat, on the edge of your seat. It, yeah. It, words. That it was because they were, like, in bed and everything. I'm like, what time is she calling her bed? Yeah, it's like, is this 2 a.m. or... <laughs> yeah. Um, but, I mean, it could have been either way. There was a point where she get, goes, oh, I guess, like, you know, Tia would have would would have told you that. Um, or I guess she told you, and I don't know if that was her having a self-realization of, oh yeah, you know, here's this info. Oh, but yeah, she already told you. Um, one of those does... forty-five second long voicemails you get every once in a while, where right. they're having the whole conversation. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so we finally meet Maggie's dad. Uh, and that's an awkward interaction. The most awkward ever. Yeah. Um. When he got off the bus, did you guys just have a bad feeling about where this was going? Yeah. Okay. Because he didn't like. There was nothing about the the them reuniting that was kind of like, oh look, like and it, you, they when he walked off the bus, I, I was just like, this is not going to go good at all. I this think, isn't going to be a feel good moment. Yeah. Um, they, they were throwing me for loops though, like because it's obvious that he still cares. He mentions that he was following her career through you know, the internet and Google. Um, and he showed up. So I'm like, well, maybe he's trying to make an effort. Maybe he's seen the error of his ways or whatever. Did you guys feel like there was guilt there too? Yeah, I think so. I think that was another part of it. Yeah, I, I feel like, I feel like he feels guilty because he wants to have his daughter in his life. And he's obviously proud of her in some, you know, in some way. He's been following her career he's impressed that she mm -hmm. solved a, a cold case and um there's 
there's love for her there. You know, he, he keeps the picture in his wallet and, um, but at the same time, like there's just, I don't know, you know, like why, why hasn't he been the one to reach out at all? And, and maybe that's where the guilt comes in. Maybe he feels guilty for not ever having reached out and maybe, or maybe he didn't reach out because of the guilt because he goes, you know, I, I dropped my daughter off on the side of the road at, you know, her aunt's house and that was it. I don't know. But in in any event, it is awkward. Oh, yeah. It's it's really awkward. And, you know, uh, fast forward to the shower and even the music selection indicates the cheesiness of the event, which um, <laughs> Maggie and Cara were talking about at the beginning of the episode, um, talking about how Eliza was going to make sure it was, you know, Pinterest idea, cheesy wedding shower <laughs> and it yeah. was like every single and part it of it memory boards and <laughs> yeah right everything else and trivia about your bride and yeah, yeah. so we um <laughs> trivia about your other at uh like a wedding party like that would lead to a fight right <laughs> because like, yeah I did you see only... how like panicked alex looked by the way <laughs> i i would be too just because like okay i i've been with deb a very long time but if there was something simple that i didn't know the answer to I could just see that, just like, hey, remember when we were at the shower and you you didn't remember my favorite color is teal? I'd yeah, be like, Ooh. like <laughs> I, I, my memory is really hit or miss. Like, I Same. can either recite an entire like thesis paper, or I can't remember what I did five minutes ago. Like, it, there is almost no in between. <laughs> I'm it's, so glad I'm not alone. <laughs> it's either very specific and like, and I have a visual memory, so most of the time, you know, if I see it, I can remember verbatim whatever was there. But, um, but yeah, I, there's there's also like little things that I just do not remember. Like someone, uh, I actually got into a little bit of a. Not not a serious fight, but like a joking, like, wow, you're the worst kind of fight with someone recently because they were just like, yeah, this happened. What? When? Like the first time we hung out. Oh. Oh. My bad. <laughs> and could you imagine Sorry. if that was somebody you were do like to marry? Like, this was when I knew. And you're like, wait, what happened? Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I, there's loads of things I can't remember. Same. Um, it, it's usually... It's so funny. It's usually guys too. Guys will be like, "Oh yeah, you know, we uh we met like at this place or whatever." And I remember you're like you were wearing this or this was happening. And yeah, I'm like, "Okay, oh, so what that's you're describing what, what you're describing right there is <laughs> guys remembering things about pretty girls." Not <laughs> so that's, that's true. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? You you're not getting into like, "Oh, it's like you smelled like lavender and you were wearing this." It's like, "Oh, that's fucking creepy. Stop." <laughs> Like, I know, but still, um, someone recently was just like, oh, yeah, I met I, I I saw you at this place. We actually had a conversation. And I was like, oh, we did. <laughs> about, about what? About what? <laughs> D&D. Oh, that's neat. So we get to see. <laughs> Speaking of memories, though, those uh, that cheesy picture board or whatever, you know, we, we noticed that. Alex is the one with all the pictures on there and there's not one for. Maggie because she doesn't have any of those pictures because her mom got rid of all of them and also she probably didn't get to have any when she was sent packing Um, and so you know there's a there's a moment there you know Maggie's dad shows up and he's a little bit awkward with Alex at first um, and awkward just being there but then he seems impressed that Alex is a federal agent and you know she's obviously good looking um, she's she's warm and and receptive and um, she I don't know she she seems like a good catch I feel like and uh, and he tries to be understanding and he tries to be I don't know just the a, dad a dad <laughs> um, and he he has this moment where he goes, how come there's no pictures of you? Like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, he takes out a picture, a worn picture out of his wallet of Maggie. And he, he kisses it and adds it to the board, which is, I think, super important. Um, he is set in his own ways, but he, he loves his daughter all the same, you know, like, it, it, it's, it's so weird, but, 
that is how people are. They love their children and yet they can still do these these cruel things or they think it's they don't think it's wrong or I don't know. They're, they're stuck in their ways and even though he loves her it still wasn't enough. Like he can't get over I guess his fears. Yeah, and he was doing pretty well until Maggie and Alex kissed. Yeah, I think and he was trying to convince himself that he could yeah, this could I can deal with this right up until that kiss. And then he was like, "No, I can't. I, I I quit." I so so here's here's the thing with this. You know, he uh I I'm really conflicted on him and his views and his reasoning and um you know, he kind of makes Good points until he doesn't. So he <laughs> he gives a little bit more background on his struggle. And when I, when Maggie mentioned earlier, you know, you don't know where my dad came from and this and that. So, you know, he came to America from Mexico. He worked crap jobs. He put up with racism and beatings and worked his ass off to get where he is so that his family could live a better life. And so that, you know, his family would be free from hatred and bigotry and and cruelty. And that's a great point. That's a great goal. That's a great thing to do and, and hope for for your family. That's strong. That's solid. But to then from there reason that, you know, he can't be a part of her life if she's going to live the way that she does... I, I don't know. Like she tells him the world has changed. You know, I'm accepted for who I am and no one, you know, no one bothers me about it. And there's not as much hatred anymore as there was. And I, I think for the most part, she's true or she's right. And that's true. Mm -hmm. Um, there's, there's far less hate. There is still hate, but there's a lot more acceptance. Yeah. There's more acceptance than hate. I think, um, and, you know, he also, he he that, gives that whole speech, but then he says, you know, you can live however you please, but don't expect me to stick around to witness it. Um, the only thing that America hates more than Mexicans is homosexuals. Yeah. I think was the exact quote that yep. I was just like, I'm going to turn this off. So, um, <laughs> yeah. I got to say, this is the thing that I respect about Supergirl probably the most is that they don't shy away from things that are difficult to talk about. They don't shy away from things that are relevant to our current political climate or social climate in this country. Um, and what? newsbusters.org actually wrote an article about that scene from this episode. And although they weren't happy about it. The, <laughs> yeah, but you know, I mean, I, I'm into it. I'm glad that they, they, I don't know. They just go for it. They, they go for it. They don't shy away from it. Um, so this article says Supergirl reminds us America hates Mexicans and homosexuals. And that's a pretty like buzzworthy type of headline there, but, um, like <laughs> yeah, you know, um, but they, they go on to add a clip of the show and a, uh, like the, the script there. Yeah, yeah. They transcribe yeah. it. And he says, let's see. But, okay, so basically the the article gets into, you know, the whole point is we have Linda Carter as our president on this earth who is an alien who signed the Amnesty Act. And they're bringing in what is te technically an Earth One issue. Right? Basically. Like, you know, it's not like the wall thing is something that's going on on this earth. And I think that's where they're... You know, they this kind of gets confusing for some things, and that's why it was just like kind of maybe off putting for me personally, other than okay. like guilt. Um, is that you know, this was supposed to this is supposed to be the land where they accept all races, sexes, a, you know, aliens, you know, humans all live together, you know, and the president is this, and and for them to, to bring up what is technically and not an issue on their, you know earth per se like because we wouldn't see linda carter an alien building a wall i just thought it was them again maybe taking a shot at a president but this one was in a more direct way than just being like you would have to be an idiot not to know this type scenario yeah and, it it kind of 
mixed it there because it's like, why would an alien president even do that? Yeah. Well, maybe, you know, it started before she went into office and, you know, they're still working on that or taking it down or what. You know what I mean? Like there's mm. there is ways around that. It's not like they went into all detail about it. I know. It. It, it just seemed weird to me. Like it was a forced problem on that earth, let's say. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. I can see that. Um, I... To me, it doesn't bother me as much. Um, I I appreciate the platform there more than the um, cohesiveness, mm -hmm. I guess, that would be achieved by not bringing that up. But I I don't know, you know, and and maybe that was a maybe that's a a, a state specific thing. Maybe a state was doing it, or you know, like there's ways. It's TV. Yeah. You could find ways to rationalize stuff. Yeah, very true. Um, but yeah, this this website is definitely not. not they are happy not pleased. About it. <laughs> um, oh Jesus, we know the drill by now. Homosexual people are mistreated in America. Mexican immigrants are mistreated in America. Even bigoted Mexicans can be blamed on America, and that's how bad we are. Blah blah blah. Yeah. Um, but that's you know, <laughs> yeah, blah 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 included. But um, you know, that's that's a good point, and I really didn't think about that, Bob. I was uh, I was honed in on the emotions of the scene rather than the. Uh, the split between our actual real world and the earth that this show is on. Yeah, and see, and I always have that issue to where um, I want to watch TV and movies and stuff to forget, you know, to to escape. And I think, you know, when I hear weird, like, buzzwords like that. that really just, specific things? Yeah, that it just throws me off. And it's stuff that, you know, won't stand the test of time. As far as the show goes, you know, when they when they make very specific, you know, jokes, you know, even like uh, pop culture references that if you were to go five years, 10 years from now for Netflix and like my daughter started watching the shows wouldn't make sense to her. Yeah. You know, and, and I just I don't know. I, I mean, I got I got the same way with Defenders when, you know, Luke Cage brought up white privilege to Danny Rand. And I was just like, ugh. I didn't even watch Defenders. Yeah. I watched one episode. But, it, forward, it, but again, it might just be something that sticks with me, like as a person, or I'm just like I I want to forget, and I'm okay with them bringing up like again the race, the sexuality type thing. I could understand, but you know, mm -hmm. just to throw up you know the wall thing out of nowhere, especially for this Earth that is not run by you know what you know, an, an alien per se is just, it, I don't know, sure. left, left a little bad taste in my mouth. I get it. That's, that's fair. Uh, let's wrap up this Alex and Maggie talk with, uh, the one thing that got brought up again, that might cause a rift between them, <laughs> which is the kids the thing kid topic. Yeah. Um, you know, they talk about it again and, and it seems like Alex was thinking that, um, getting some closure with her family might convince Maggie that, Hey, kids ain't so bad. You know, she, maybe the reason Maggie didn't want to have kids is because her relationship with her parents was rough, but turns out Maggie just can't see kids in the picture in the future. And Hey, that's okay. Mm -hmm. But you know, she, she says, Hey, listen, I see our future. It's rich. It's full. There's friends, there's love. There's, you know, we're doing things, but kids aren't included in that. You're all I need. And all I need to know from you is, you know, whether I'm all you need. And Alex agrees and says, you are. Yeah, of course you are. But I did not believe that for a second. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, I didn't. Maybe it's Maggie a, did. <laughs> it's a you are. But, you know, it's mm -hmm. it's not solid i mean maggie is the person she wants to be with and she'll either make a sacrifice or she won't yeah and it almost sounded like like did this break down a wall let me bring it up again okay no it didn't well you know we're fine and i just feel like if if it comes up again i think we'll have more issues with it i think strike it, three and you're out type of deal yeah i think it has to come up again they wouldn't bring it up twice for no reason what if we're just like planning this breakup and we find out she gets transferred because she's such a great cop? <laughs> I'd be like, damn it. Well, I mean, whatever. <laughs> you know you know what I mean? Like I could just see like something like that happening. 
<laughs> basically. I don't know, man. Something's going to happen, though. Yeah. We're going to get some relationship drama, some wedding drama. All righty. You want to do a live On read real quick? Note, yeah, let's do a live read. Oh. Go ahead. Adam and Eve wants to give you more with free gifts. Go to adamandeve.com and you'll find over 18,000 adult entertainment products, including toys, lingerie, and a seemingly endless selection of adult DVDs. And there's more. We're giving you 10 free gifts. A gift for her, a gift for him, plus a special gift you and your partner will both like, plus six full-length adult DVDs and free shipping. So head over to adamandeve.com and enter offer code RAINMAN at checkout. What if you're like Maggie and Alex here? Like, it's a gift for her and a gift for him. <laughs> like, do they have a lesbian or gay option? They better. I'm. I feel like they should. Right. I feel like they probably do. I don't know. Or they probably have gay friends. Give one of the ones for him to. <laughs> you know. Who knows? Uh, whatever. The him and him package. Yeah. The him and him package. Or maybe it'll be like a cock ring that vibrates, and then you can put it on a dildo that one <laughs> of these. Or a strap uses. on. I don't know. You know. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> we went there. Okay. <laughs> All right. So now, the- <laughs> speaking of man on man, let's talk about John. <laughs> All right. So we had this. Uh, we had this. This format that Supergirl's been doing a lot of, which is two simultaneous storylines kind of evolving alongside each other with with a specific tie together, and that tie this week was dads. So. <laughs> <laughs> we we have Jean going to Mars. You know, we got that that message from Megan at the end of last episode, which seemed a little sketchy to me at first, but turns out it was real. It was really from Megan, and he needed to go to Mars. When they first showed up in Mars, and all the other white Martians showed up, were you like, "Oh, Jesus, was a trap"? No. When Megan walked out, I knew it wasn't. Even then, even when the white Martians walked out in their regular white Martian form, mm-hmm. um. I think I I could recognize that it was supposed to create some sort of tension and concern of oh, is this a trap? But uh, you know what? No, I really didn't see that. I I could recognize that they were trying to do that, but I knew that it wasn't. Um, so we find out first of all that Jean has a ship, and it's an awesome ship, <laughs> and it's an old retro car. I love it. It's uh, the <laughs> coolest. There was pictures on Instagram with her in that car, and I was like, what the fuck are they doing? <laughs> what you is know? this? It turns out to be a freaking ship. Yeah. Turns out <laughs> <laughs> the ship has the same shape-shifting capabilities as Jean. I feel like I that should it. be shared. Seriously. Like, with other things in the, you know. What do you mean? Like, is only the car can shape-shift? Like, I feel like, you know, they should have it at, for their work. Oh. Well, <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. He should share that with the DEO. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm with you. Um, so they know they take a little road trip to Mars and they get there and it turns out. Well, hold on. I, I wish they would have back to the future to where we're going. We don't need no roads. And then fucking took off. Oh, they, I think they missed it. Missed right there. opportunity. Like big time. <laughs> yeah. You're right. I just thought about that. We Sorry. don't need roads. Um, <laughs> God, you're right. They yep missed opportunity. But uh, they they get to Mars and because uh, Kara doesn't feel like he should go alone because this is a a big deal. He's the last green Martian. Oh, but wait, he's not the last green Martian. <laughs> Turns out uh, Papa Jones is alive. Papa Jones. Papa Jones. Papa Jones. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Papa John Jones. Um, so he's I mean. There's there's this moment of like, hey, I called you here because I was pretty sure you wouldn't believe me if I told you through like a psychic message. Uh, look at this screen. It's your dad. And she's totally right. Like if someone was just like, oh, by the way, your dad's here. He'd be like, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Hundreds of years later. Yeah. So uh, it's. That's a that's a big and that's a big reveal for him. Um, they it seems like he's the only 
survivor from these camps because some of these camps were still active. And um, I don't know if that means that they wiped out whatever Green Martians were left there when they left the facility or if he was the only one left or, or what. But he got rescued. And he's been like tortured for 100, 200 years, yeah, however like, yeah, long it's been. Say 200 years. Yeah, I think it's been two centuries. Um, and there's some guilt there on Jean's end because he left. You know, he assumed that all of his family was dead, which is not unreasonable to assume, especially when, you know, you're the only one that's out and about and, and out of the yeah. camps. And, uh, and, you know, your immediate family is dead, your daughters and your, or, or at least you think, you know what I mean? Like, it's just how, how do you resolve that guilt? First of all, <laughs> how do you deal with that? Um, I, I, yeah. What, what is what, like, what is worse? Like your parents, like abandoning you or like you just kind of like thinking that everybody you loved and everything is dead and you running away and finding out that they've been just fucking tortured and, you know, right. taken advantage of this whole time. And, and like you not having some kind of connection or feeling or even wanting to go back because you're scared. Well, scared and and probably just feeling hopeless, like you can't do anything to save them because you're only one person. Yeah. Um. And so there's, you know, there's there's got to be a lot of emotions running through his mind right now when he's discovering that his father is alive and right in front of him now. Um, he's got to be relieved and thrilled to find out that his father is alive and he has a remaining family member. However. He did leave and flee to Earth and kind of gave up on the idea of finding any other green Martians. Um, and, oh, my God, could he have saved his father from this fate? Potentially, maybe. At least sooner. Um, could have brought him in his car. Right. <laughs> or I don't know. It's just there's there's guilt. There's relief. There's um, probably excitement for the first time. Excitement. There's there's sadness. There's uh, there's a lot of conflicting things happening. Um, and, and does that mean we can see more green Martians in the future? Maybe. Does that mean that maybe, maybe they're not the last two, you know, like, maybe, you... maybe there are other. I'm like, him and his dad can't have sex. I wasn't talking about mating <laughs> and producing <laughs> offspring. I was like, well, well wait, what? <laughs> no, but I mean, seriously, this is, they thought that they were all gone, but then they found an active camp. Yeah. And when the white Martians, when the bad white Martians fled it, they, left in their wake a living green Martian. Yeah. You know, so what are the odds that maybe there are still some more green Martians out there and maybe there's any sort of chance for that race? I don't know. They don't seem to be considering it, so probably not, I guess. But Yeah, but, but we never considered another family member showing up. Right. Um. You know, and he's been through so much that Jean tries to go talk to him and the whole time he just doesn't even believe that it's his son. He doesn't even take the time or the chance to like do that mind bondy thing and see if it actually is him because he's so used to tricks from being held captive by the white Martians for so long. Of course they would use his son to try and break him and figure out where the staff is and blah, blah, blah. Um, This whole episode, well, this you know, this part of this episode, this whole storyline, we get so much more Jean and and so much more Mars and the background and religion and what the, the society there was like than we ever have. We see um we see a lot about the actual culture and faith of Mars, you know, using this this staff that they're looking for um, and we get to see what his father is like. He's a, he's a devout man. And then from there, we get to take it a step further and we get to see a little bit of what John's family life was. And it's right in the fields. It's surprisingly normal. And it's sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Just two little girls running around giggling having fun being kids 
when their grandpa comes to the door and, oh, shush, you didn't tell your dad, right? You kept this a secret to surprise his adult son on his birthday. This is, I mean, that's the kind of stuff you see on Earth. Yeah. What is my favorite memory? You know, and, and that's there. Um, what Which I, is a simple one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and those are always the thing. It's, you know, a certain look or a certain way somebody laughed at something that is, is the memorable things in life. Um, what I liked was that they brought up like the two little girls and what I kind of mirrored it back to was um, Kara and Alex and how he takes care of them and looks after them. Yeah. You know, it was just like, oh, you could you could see, you know, you know, even though it was a CGI character, like the same type of look and compassion for them as he has for, you know, the alien daughters that we see in that flashback. Well, and and that's that's so true because there's a lot of things at play there with John and his relationship with the Danvers girls. Um, he feels at least moderately responsible. I mean, I that's being that's being generous. He feels responsible for what happened with Jeremiah, for sure. You know, it, which means they lost out on some fathering. Um, he also lost his own two girls. So I think he's been, I think, and I, and I say this in a way that almost sounds kind of like bad, but I don't mean it that way at all. I think he, he has used the relationship that he has with them to allow himself to heal as well. Yeah. Um, or at least to, to channel that love and that, that emptiness that would be there without the ability to kind of be a father figure. Um, Cause this, he has that in him and he wants to, be be a father figure to two young girls and i mean they're young adults at this point but um but it allows him to to let that out and to to tap into that and it's good for them you know they it's been a really mutually beneficial relationship for the three of them Mm -hmm. um but i think you're right it's definitely like a, a parallel there he looks at those little girls and the danvers girls the same way and, um, and I did appreciate how, you know, the, with his dad, how, you know, his big fear was losing his son twice. Yeah. You know, thinking like having that hope for the first time in hundreds of years. And then if it was a trick, you it know, would, how crushing that would be. It would be crushing. It would be heartbreaking. Totally heartbreaking. Um, And and Kara, I thought it was it was really good that Kara was there to jump in and say, hey, listen, you know, I, I know that you think that this is a trick. I know you don't believe that. But, like, look at me, first of all. You know, you can tell that I'm not a shapeshifter. You should be able to sense that. Um, I'm a, you know, yes, I'm a Kryptonian. And um, I come from a dead planet, a dead world, a dead people. There's no more of me. Um, you know, other than her cousin, but whatever. But, you know. Um, But... Yeah, I mean that was she was the perfect person to convince him to at least give Jean a chance to prove that he is who he says he is and not just some dick shapeshifting and <laughs> pretending <laughs> to try and crack um his dad. So it's just it's yeah, that was it was really really good. There was a good point too that she made about how his people may be dead, but he's a man of faith. Um, And he's a man of of good will, I want to say. And, like, even though there's no hope for the green Martians, there is hope for white Martians who want to be better than those who came before them. Just because their ancestors were terrible or just because they're, you know, some of their other extended members of their family are terrible and still following that that horrible way of living um, doesn't mean that they can't make things better and they can't push things forward and progress them so you know give it a chance and you can help a whole other race of people be better than what they have been um and he you know we we see him finally give in and he allows john to share that memory that we talked about and it's just it's really touching this is this is an episode full of family feels some are horrible and some are great yeah, and again, we, we talked about the kind of the dual stories going on throughout, and you definitely see how things could go really, really good and really, really bad. And like you talked about, they're not afraid to go both ways, you know. It's 
you know, it's a, it's always a risk to kind of have a downer type thing, but they balanced it out with the other half of a character that we know and love kind of getting something for him for the first time in forever. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's... I, I'm consistently impressed with where this show is willing to go with the emotions in it and the, the subject matter and um, just committing to what their characters are going through and, and what the people working on the show feel and believe. So let's finish up with some of the less feelsy things. <laughs> let's talk about some technical stuff. Um, this episode had a lot of CG. It had a lot of aliens and it had some fighting. And um, I thought some were better than others. Um, I think all the aliens looked fine. They looked good. It was like the collision, like with the fight scene. Yep. Th- that. Yeah. Okay. You know it. Yep. Mm-hmm. It was the fight scene that was awkward. You're just like, wow. I mean, because even like you got lost in the scene. The C- I mean, it was 100% CGI with the, the, the memory, you know, and the little yeah. kids walking through and everything. And, and you got lost in that scene and you're like, all right, cool. Like you, it didn't distract from it. And so it was very, very good there. But man, when when Kara goes to swing or Supergirl goes to swing, and you're just like, wow, that wasn't even close. Yeah, like the <laughs> one of the Martians. Not even close. Well, and like one of the Martians hit another Martian, but the the hit like didn't connect. The other one like flew away from the impact without mm-hmm. even being hit. And I, mm, guys, that was a little weird. And it seemed slow too. Yeah. It, it was slow. It was one of those. I was just like, oh, you guys were doing so good. And then this like janky action scene came up. Supposed to speed up the hits so that you can't tell that it's not real. Yeah. Not exactly. slow it down. You need to blur it a little. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, I mean, even the car turning into the spaceship was fine. Yeah. It was yeah. Just, that was kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, this is the first like really janky fight scene we've had. Yeah. Um, but the rest of the CG looked great, and the aliens during the fight looked fine. Yeah, it was just it was like just the, you didn't have the them movement. punch the right green tennis ball or whatever it was. Yeah, it was just to, odd to make actual a collision happen. Um, but I will say, you know, it's it's becoming ever clear that uh, Melissa Benoist is comfortable with those superhero takeoffs and landings, and. Um, you know, the the people involved with it technically are also, you know, really finding their groove. It, it's just it just feels natural. She's not overacting into it anymore. You know, it's just a uh, OK, bye. I'm going to pop off now. Whee. It's just real smooth and casual. Yeah. Um. So all of that stuff looks great. So. How should a Kryptonian's powers work in Mars? Being a little further away from the sun, right? Hmm. Um, Still the yellow sun. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it would be much different. Yeah, I never know what to believe anymore because you like you know you think of like Man of Steel when they fly up and he gets out of the Earth's atmosphere and he's adjusted to it for so long that he has a problem breathing it anymore when he gets out of it and I you know I start looking in things like that I'm going which one of these is true to like the lore of Kryptonians? So I mean, I don't think. Her powers are going to be that much different within the first, like, five-ish planets in our solar system, personally. As long as the sun's round somewhere. Yeah, I think I think she would still have all of her powers in our solar system because, you know, it's a yellow sun and the sun does hit all of those planets. It just might be a little, a little more diluted um, the further out she gets. But Mars is... You know, it, there's there's only a difference of like fifty million miles or something like that. You're just making up stuff. No, <laughs> maybe <laughs> Mars is 141.6 million miles away from the sun, and Earth is 92.96 million miles. Okay. Mm. Um, <laughs> I just I don't know. It's you know they're like the next planet over. Yeah. So I don't I don't know. I don't think that is going to affect it too much. I think maybe slightly again less it, it's it's it. a it's a fucking 100% nerdy thing. It's No, totally. <laughs> you know, it's not a a 
real thing like it's yeah. not not worth discussing though. i know um I, yeah i don't think it would be that different you know she she has the yellow sun on all these planets um plus i think uh last point here i think that she would probably still have even if she was like away away from the sun she would still have some of that residual like uh soaked up energy you know what i mean like yeah, like it would last a little bit. Yeah, it's not like as soon as she gets in the shade and the sun's beams aren't touching her, her powers are Damn gone. Damn you, cloud cover. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, Supergirl can't come into work today. It's overcast. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think it's an issue. Anyway, um, final thoughts on this episode. Nicole. I thought it was good. I liked the... I always love it when they approach the very difficult topics and like really get into it. So I always appreciate that. And Maggie scenes just stole the show for me. Like it was just amazing. So overall, even with the uh, slightly janky fight scenes, (laughs) (laughs) I really enjoyed this episode. Bob. Yeah, um, it's it's always one of those things that I, as a producer of these shows, I always try to keep things as light as we can. And Supergirl makes it hard because they do hit those topics that are kind of more serious that we should discuss and not just make fun of. <laughs> um, so it, do you it, imagine Ryan? Yeah, yeah, that's why we don't bring Ryan on. Anything yeah, that's sensitive. why he's not on here. <laughs> um, so it w- it was a very very feels episode. Um. The, again, using Supergirl as like a secondary character to uh, John going up there was awesome. You know, it just shows that you don't always have to base it around, you know, an Oliver Queen or Barry Allen, that you can go out to those characters. And that's why we care about those characters a lot. You know, we brought that up. That is because they do stories around them. You know, it's not always Supergirl has to save the world. It's, oh, Wynn's going through something. Alex is going through something. Supergirl's there to support yeah. So it, it is a nice like kind of play on like what is normally, you know, for the CWA prototypical superhero, they are the center of the universe, nobody else really matters type thing. Yeah. I got to agree. I I think I'm I'm more invested in the characters in this show overall like as a whole than I am in some of the other shows on the CW. And that's not because the characters aren't necessarily good or whatever, but I just feel like I am more involved in their lives in this show. Um, and some of them may kind of go in and out. I'm a little disappointed that we don't see more win. Um, but I think they've found that he's not necessarily as um, integral to Supergirl's immediate life and all of her goings ons. Um and maybe that's why we see less of him. The last time we did was relationship drama, but uh, it's still, you know, it, anytime something comes up for one of them, it's a it's a legit story, and it's not just filler crap. Yeah, they're not just throwing them in there to have them in there. Yeah, so I think you guys are are totally on point with that. I they do a great job at at making the whole inner circle of Supergirl's life and rich and feel like someone's real circle of friends and family so it's just a plus all around and and the acting in this show is so not soap opera e you know there's drama but it's not over the top it it, it feels more raw on this mm-hmm. show big time yeah mm-hmm. so let's just fix that janky fight scene and uh i'm good all across the board <laughs> <laughs> let's not do that again and we're good yeah uh so on that note that's gonna be it for today's dc on cw supergirl edition you can always catch any past and future dc on cw episodes through the rain man digital app and be sure to follow us on social medias we've got twitter at dc on cw facebook.com slash dc on cw and our instagram is at dc underscore on underscore cw and we will catch you next time Stay tuned, Legends of Tomorrow will be next. I'm Supergirl. You're who now?